Hello and welcome to the next session at MPTS Connect. This one's all about post-production, less looking back at what's happened during the pandemic and lockdown, more looking Hello, forward. Hello and welcome to the next session well, at okay, MPTS Okay, I can hear myself, which is always slightly disconcerting. Just going to see if I've got something happening. The pandemic and lockdown, more looking forward. The next session at MPTS Connect. Okay, I can hear myself, which is always slightly disconcerting. Let's oh. see. I don't know if anyone else can... Yeah, that's better. Stopped. Right. I, I had this slightly weird situation where everything I said was coming back to me, uh, which is yeah, never nice to life. Well. I thought it was a commercial oh. track bike, uh, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, unfortunately, I think that stopped. So that's good. We can uh, move on. And we haven't got a lot of time. Yeah. So I'm not going to blabber on about uh, technical problems. I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves. Um, Rowan, can you start us off, say who you are and what you do? Hi, I'm the MD of the ClickUp group, comprising ClickUp Pictures, the Edit Store, ClickUp Nations and Regions based in Birmingham, and Clear Motion for VFX. Okay. Hi, Rowan. And Fiona, how about you? Hi, I'm Fiona Burton. I was formerly uh, engineering and post-production head at A&E, and I'm starting with the collective on Monday in a similar role. All right. Wow. That okay, goes well. Um, Nigel. Hi. Um, I'm CEO of Molinaire. Um, Founder, Chairman of PIP Studios. Okay, short and sweet. Good stuff. We'll find out a bit more about those in a short while. And Dave, I, I think we can hear you now. Yeah, you can hear me now. I'm Dave, uh, CEO, Founder of Envy. Uh, that's short and sweet as well. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, I'm going to move on to our first question. You've got a bit of background written already in the summary for this um, session. But uh, just to say that the UK's post-production industry has had to transition along with everyone else, uh, about a wide range of complex operations from office based to remote home working, um, starting back obviously in March last year. But with lockdown restrictions now easing off, got a new sense that the world's coming back to normal again, uh, as normal as that will get. We've got new hybrid working models, which appear to be taking uh, sort of precedence at post-production with clients still able to drop into offices in Soho and uh, elsewhere. but also utilizing the sort of home remote working options that they now have for editing, especially offline editing and some of the finishing as well. Um, but that's a model now that seems quite well established as for a few months is a, is a long period to get something well enough established. Is this likely to be something that's going to replace what was pre-pandemic now? Or do you think there's a, a likelihood that things will gradually go back to you know, what it was like before with more office-based working? Rowan, I'm going to start off with you because you're top left corner on my uh, screen. So, yeah, what's your, th what's your thinking on this? Uh, we've been using remote working for about four and a half, five years now for, for specific purposes. And, and I think that's the answer is when, when it's better for a team to be together in a, in a suite, in a, a building, that's what they'll want to do. Collaboration is easier. Um, you know, getting things done, understanding each other's needs is easier. But when a remote solution is the right one or there are good production needs to do it, we all now we have the tools and I think clients will be more willing to embrace them. So since lockdown's eased off, have you found more clients are coming into the your office spaces compared to before? If I'm being honest, because of the nature of the work we do, we've been open all the way through. But it is getting easier to accommodate clients and the numbers are increasing here. Right. And so with all the sort of social distancing restrictions and all that kind of stuff, you can how, how many compared to before? I mean, what's the sort of proportion of people? Oh, it's again? a fraction. Right. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll be in, in sort of 20 people in a building that used to have 150. Right. Uh, however, uh, you know, we are very well spaced out because we have edit suites mm. and sound suites. So lots of people behind closed doors. Uh, social distancing in a, in a post house is actually, I think, easier than it is for production companies. Right. Okay. Um, Fiona, I'll come to you in a second. Uh, but Nigel, so you, you obviously look after another big facility with uh, different offices around Soho as well. Um, what's what's uh, what's it been like at Molnair? Yeah. So I mean, I think like, like us all, I think pretty much through the pandemic, there was remote working solutions that was built into our businesses. I mean, I've got to say, we built a lot of our services, Molly Stream, Molly Remote, Molly Sync, Molly Vault, through this process because we weren't set up for that. But what we have seen now as we come out of uh, the pandemic, um, great rollout of the vaccine, is that people want to get back into the building. And certainly when there's producers, directors running multiple shows, they want to be in the edit suite. And I've got to say, pretty much from the end of May, June, 
we're, we're actually up to full capacity in a lot of our offline suites and kind of we built processes through COVID to make sure we could have people in out of the building because Dolby Atmos and certain things you cannot do from home and, and you know whether it's remote reviewing or not there's been a big push from our clients to come into the building again for all of us we've had our challenges to hold off from that because our staff and, and clients have to you know come first in this but mm. There is a big push and I can say from my own perspective, years ago being a creative, those little nuances that happen in an edit suite or even in a mixed theatre, sometimes even a call like this, a video call, you can't pick up on that. And I think sometimes when people are in the room, you can communicate to people without even talking sometimes. And I think it's something that we should all take into account. The industry will come back. As Rowan said, remote working gives us that flexibility I think that is crucial to a lot of the things that we do for our services. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I see the industry coming back quite quickly. Okay, interesting. So, uh, both of you have on a sort of similar uh, thinking there as to the, these changes that you've had to make over the last 12 to 18 months are there, they're technically possible, but whether they're wanted longer term is debatable. Uh, Fiona, what, what's, what's your thinking and what's your experience so far on this? Um, well, my, you know, experience is basically from, uh, you know, A&E and from a broadcaster perspective. And uh, like Rowan said, we had remote editing uh, solutions in probably about four or five years before COVID. So from a technology standpoint, um, you know, not, nothing changed. It was just a matter of scaling up what was 10 remote workstations to 40 um, in a short space of time. But I found it's very much the culture um of the people using them or the teams using them um, some bosses are really happy with their teams going out and using remote edit stations some people uh, want to have their teams in the building with them sitting around them so you know from, from my point of view it's being able to um uh you know supply them with the technology um and you know how how they get, go and use them then the team's got to have their own culture and you know, want to be able to go out and use it. I found that advertising remote working um, by showing uh, production companies that, you know, you can use it down the path. Um, <laughs> uptake is quite high then, so yes. Yeah, yeah, there are advantages, certainly. Uh, once pubs are, are, are places you can sit inside again, that's from Monday, so uh, yeah. yes, <laughs> can imagine some people taking that as a, a more uh, attractive office space. <laughs> um, Dave, obviously you, you guys have got multiple buildings big buildings around um, london must have been quite a challenge for you I, I would say over the last year a very different way of working uh, how are you finding things now yeah i agree with the guys but we had we've been doing remote editing for quite a while uh, so we, we, we had a handle on that we had the client saying what's next what are you going to do because they wanted to evacuate quite quickly uh, as half the operational guys did but it was weird that the finishing guys wanted to maintain their strengths in the buildings because you can you know like Nigel said you need to contact the client to, if you're doing a mix do you want to hear it together so mm. all our finishes including our grade is just opted to stay into the building uh, I challenged the guys to I've always wanted an app and we, we had a discussion in early April about you know if we're going to have a remote system let's go through an app so we can match onto it and so we set our task to design it we used a third party to help us out and then we got that ready to launch that in November and I'm glad we did because I think remote editing is going to be around for a little more. Uh, we've got Capture now and they will be you know, remote editing on site. But we just wanted to make it a bit more robust, but not just to edit you know, and communicate with the editor. We wanted to use our app to communicate with the production circle so they can interact with the editor, they can view through it and, and prep work and look at rehearsal stage. So we don't didn't want to alienate the editor away from the production team because I agree with Nigel, the, the, the guys want to come back into the facility and they're coming back in their droves now. Hmm. So there's certain jobs like a top gear or a voice, they want to be collaborative on the day with their 20 or 30 editors. You can't replicate that in Mill Hill or Barnes or Wilsdon, whoever these guys are going to work from, so it's good. But on the remote side of things, it's, it's helped us uh, achieve uh, some root, uh, regional access as well. So mm. some positive came out of it. But yeah, when we all, like everybody on the screen, we evacuated in March, you know, how long did we think it was going to go on for? And I, I was part pessimistic about it. And I, I talked to my guys early just to sort of work out. Let's say, let's put a year stamp on it. We might not be in the buildings again. So 
that's why you rush through the app to get online. But uh, now I agree with the guys that the clients are wanting to come back and, and be back in the building to be collaborative with, the, with their operators, which is the only way you can do it. So, yeah, did I think about losing sites? Actually, we've just gained another floor next door, which we're trying to get ready for August. So I think people will come back, as Nigel mentioned, in their droves because there's nothing like being in a room with a creative, in my opinion, and it works very well. Hmm. It's interesting because my next question was about the future of Soho, you know, with the <clears throat> the physical locations and all the on-premise kit and all that kind of stuff. But it seems, you know, from what you're all saying that you're very confident things will get back to what they were like before March last year. You know, your clients are wanting to come back. You've got the spaces. There won't be the social, need for the social distancing uh, so much. And, you know, there's probably that same need for those physical locations and offices certainly in in that sort of central hub but are you just being like ultra optimistic now and you know can soho sustain the the levels of activity and the levels of sort of post-production businesses being there that uh, you know it used to have nigel um, do you want to kick us off with this yeah i mean from my point of view i mean i spent most of my life at palmer studios and shepton studios so i'm very aware of being outside of london and how that works and certainly remote working back on little dorrit in 2007 that we set up with with molinaire actually but i think the point here is is that there is a central hub of the industry and i think that you know quite honestly you're not going to just suddenly change that overnight and quite honestly for, for me I look at a long-term future of Molinaire being in those buildings it's currently at, or currently in, sorry, and, and look at that as the future because you, you can't suddenly pick up facilities that we build within these buildings and just replicate them anywhere. You know, there's years and years of, you know, everyone on this on this video call that built businesses up, and, and I think that we shouldn't lose sight of that. Remote working's great, and I, I, I touch on it here is that when we have scheduling issues with offline, it gives us great flexibility to, to bridge that gap to when they can come into the building. But as I said, you know, it, it, it all is, you know, for me, London is a key part of the industry and, and it will be, you know, uh, Warner Brothers building their facility on Tottenham Court Road, you know, then there's not, everyone's not moving out, mm. it's still there. And I think people want to come into London for the theatre in the evening, for the restaurants, you know, and certainly a lot of the clients that are coming over from America from my previous life at Pinewood would stay in London. So mm. why are they going to be going all remote working? So I, I think it's going to continue. I can't see it changing. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone else sort of add anything to that? It's a nice summary for Nigel. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, definitely on the finishing side of things, you know, when you, the sound stages we have here, you, you need to be within them to immerse yourself in them. And I think it's like Matt and Bob want to be with clients. I, I do think the remote side of things, you will get clients booking rooms and remote facility. Um, on Monday, uh, a particular client said, look, we've got rooms, but we want to latch on to some remote facility now. And they wanted 17 rooms externally pushed out to line we did that within an hour so i think it'd be a combination it might be the early stage might be remote in, into their bedroom and then they come in for the final stage of cutting but in certain projects are, are being only in rooms so our rooms are filling up you know uh, madly at the moment but it's weird when you go around to the empty rooms you see that mouse flying around the screen the, the, we we didn't really suffer a downturn because there was work stacked up to be done uh, and uh, you know, the idea coming forward looks quite promising um, but uh, yeah, I, I think so is a place to be. And you, it's a culture that's developed. People come back for that. We need to be competitive with each other. It, but yeah, that comes across to the clients. We need to be on our toes. And that's why it's all great, really. I, I'm, I'm, I'm embracing it. I'm not going to lose any sites. I think maybe we look at, you know, maybe in a couple of years' time, someone might have to look at if it shrinks or the remote thing really kicks in. But uh, I, I've got an open mind. Like I said, we just acquired a new floor, a whole house to put 25 more off light in there because our, our periscope is looking good in regards to future work. Hmm. That sounds very really positive. Rowan, are you, you yeah. have similar thinking? I, absolutely. Um, Soho is a fun place to be. NoHo, Bloomsbury, all that sort of whole central area. It's got fantastic, you know, we talk about teams. Teams need to come together every day. We're not a factory where the workers come from a particular village. People are coming from all over and coming to a central position where it's very easy for transport, there's fun life around it, it feels creative, we all know each other, there's an enormous collaboration between us. I don't think we should underestimate that. We all know each other. We might be rivals, but we're also mates, you know? Mm. Um, and and that, that it's not a village, but it's, it's a community, mm. and it, it has its value, definitely. <laughs> and, and it appeals to our global market, you know? London yeah. is a global hub. Mm. 
things getting back to normal sounds brilliant and fiona yeah i mean from a broadcaster point of view we still need soho i mean uh, a and &E production um goes into envy quite a, a, a bit for uh finishing on different campaigns so yeah it's not just i suppose the production companies but broadcasters who do use uh various finishing houses yeah we, we still need you hmm. Okay, well, one of the big talking points pre-pandemic as well was the regionalisation of post-production. I think Dave mentioned it earlier as well, that um, everyone was sort of looking as to where to pop up their next post house, you know, Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham. Is it now there's the, still the same demand for that? You know, with there's going to be obviously this slight reluctance to um, add more physical locations with all the remote working not only meaning that your clients can work remotely, but also that you can get talent, post-production talent from around the country to potentially work from home as well. Do you still, is, do you still need to be looking at um, regionalization in the same way that you did uh, maybe two years ago that you were doing then? Rowan, you've had quite a lot of experience of doing pop-up post houses, haven't you? So what's, yeah, your, what's your thinking on that? Yeah, we use our Birmingham hub to to do pop-ups. So through COVID, we were in Bristol, East Anglia, up the north and so on, as well as in Birmingham. Um, and so that works really well for us. But I think there are some fundamental misunderstandings about the nature of post-production. You know, we don't open a building and say, we've got a project, we'll open a building, we'll do some post-production and we'll see how it goes. The government seemed to want us to have post-production in Sheffield and Leeds and Bristol and Birmingham and Manchester and Norwich and everywhere. But we have to spend an inordinate amount of money. We have to commit to long-term leases. We have to train the staff and that's a massive undertaking before we can even think about opening the door to the clients. And if they do a project in Birmingham and then that next year that project's going to be in Cardiff and then the next year it's going to be in Leeds. You know, and they move around the various hospitals or ambulance services or cooking mm. shows move around and so on, then we can't track that. It took 30, 40 years to establish Bristol and Cardiff and Manchester as centres of excellence. It was already a centre of excellence in Manchester before the BBC went there. They may have chosen Salford, but there was a mm. specialism up there. Mm. And, and we've got to understand that the work and the infrastructure and the investment and the training all have to come together. And there isn't a fundamental funding model for that at the moment, which is reliable. So we're all doing it because that's what our broadcasters have asked us to do. And it's what our politicians are pushing our broadcasters to do. But it isn't without its problems and it isn't without its costs. Nothing we can't manage. We're quite good at problem solving in post. But COVID's not made any difference to future plans with that? Not for us, no. Right. No. Right. And Dave, how about you? Because you brought up regionalisation earlier on. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we're, we're slightly looks upon a slow off the mark, but I, I agree with Rowan. It's because the gearing of our business is so ginormous. You have to get that call very right. We, we, we were invited to go and look at Leeds. We were invited to look at a particular building by the council. But, you know, at that point, about a year and a half ago, there was probably three or four production companies up there. You know, we deal with a client list that's in excess of 600 in London. So I applied you. You know, reminded the guys we need more you know production companies to move up here and then they had to believe that if we went up there people would then gather it's it's okay if you're a production company with an office and a laptop and a, you know, a telephone line but it, yes as Roy mentions the gearing of us you know fundamental post house is ginormous you have to get that call really really right i'm not saying no to it but we we are we are playing uh, with a a regional device right now on, on a drawing board and uh, we'd like to go out there and we've been invited by a client to look at particular work that maintains in the region and uh, we'll look at it uh, pretty soon uh, and make a call on that but uh, i think covid related you've it, it, just got to protect your business and future proof it as much as you really might have to and uh, you, you have to go to the, you know, the watering hole. But if you went to Manchester, that watering hole is quite occupied with people up there already. And can you then win work off them? Is that fair to do? Uh, I've always been in the competitive hot pot of Soho know-how and we're so used to that. But I think the you know, mindset is to be perfectly laid out to a client expectation or you win some work that you can do a, a, a three-year deal and, and try and secure that. that. That would be a good baseline to start 
looking at a regional facility. Uh, talent's key, obviously, uh, and there's a lot of really good talented people in the region, and people move there for a reason. You know, who knows if, if we were to do a regional facility, some of the guys at Envy might say, well, I wouldn't mind yeah, going to join that hub. But uh, I think it's well within our grasp to do one when the time's right. Hmm. Great answer. Um, Nigel, what's, what's Molnair thinking on this? Yeah, I mean, I think at the minute, I think they summed it up, is that I think you have to focus on your business. You know, we've coming, just come through the toughest period of, of any business and, and that not just our industry, or most, well, all industries. And I think at the minute it's take stock, build the business up and then look at opportunities moving forward. I mean, from, from you know, my past experience of, of moving down um, Palmer Studio Wales and doing things, you know, it, it has its challenges. I mean, you know, there, there's, there is great talent, but normally they're, they're already at facilities. So if you're looking to expand an, an area, talent is one of the things I believe that we have massive shortage of, certainly production and post-production. Mm. We're just about to go through a massive peak, and whether it's in the regions or in London, mm. I think we've got our challenges. And I think it's for us as a group of people in post-production to really understand about how we can develop that and nurture that. And that's also to the regions, you know, sitting on the Screen Skills Committee, we talk about this all the time. And I think it's one of the things that collectively, you know, post previously was kind of quite difficult for people to move forward. And for us as business leaders is to is to create that pathway in the industry. And as I said, and whether that's in, in London or the regions, that's what we have to do and develop as, as business leaders. Okay, we'll talk a bit more about talent and your workforce as well in a second. But Fiona, would you like to see sort of more post houses around and about outside of London? Um, yeah, I mean, my experience has maybe mainly been London-based, and you know, most broadcasters have their head office in London. I suppose, from a broadcast point of view, our regions are regions of Europe, and so we, we we get our you know try and tap in our talent from our um, regional offices around Europe. But I mean, I suppose in this uh, context, it'd be you know, if COVID has, um, you know, made an impact, it'll be based on something like, you know, if Wales has a lockdown and England doesn't, or if Scotland has different rules than Wales, you know, maybe uh, productions have to sort of move around to where lockdowns or different rules are. Um, hopefully there are no, there are going to be no more lockdowns and, you know, the easing of restrictions is going to, going to stay. But, I mean, that's, that's sort of the only main... Um, you know, think I can see that the COVID really putting its stamp on is that there's different restrictions on what productions can do in different regions. That's a very good point. Um, conscious of time. So I'll move on to outside of, of the kind of COVID thing and, and lockdown. There has been obviously a big focus in the last year on diversity and gender balance and obviously prior to last year as well. But it's been gained more momentum with the Black Lives Matter campaign and uh, Me Too campaign. And, and the post sector does appear to have work to do in creating a more diverse workforce um i'd be interested to find out from each of you what you're doing to kind of help enable i suppose more diversity within post-production um dave do you want to kick us off with this i suppose with the academy we, we can we can we can you know have a choice of you know looking at what we need to fulfill it's, it's it's you know if you go back 30 years it was a very male dominated environment it was a bit dull and hot and sweaty it wasn't the best but uh, you know my production team you know, Poor Chris is the only male in that area, so it is. But it, we, we're trying to break that down, and I think with the academy, we've, we've we've addressed that, and we're looking at people to come in with, for different genres or woodwork wise, and just mix it up a little bit. You know, you you, you don't go into a restaurant; it's all you know. If you go into a restaurant, it's all blokes standing around drinking beer. I will walk out straight away. So we have to educate ourselves to make make that work for the environment, the post house. It's, it's it's not normal to be. You know, mm one tract with it so the academy is working on that and while we had the downturn with, with, with march we all left we put a couple of rooms together and, and called them training rooms so we wanted to set the tasks that around us to say okay as there's no client services because the clients have gone AWOL we want you to you know up in skill sector and, and, and they did that and they've been working on that so we want, we, we want to make use of that time uh, but I think we've all got to collaborate and get it together, make it a little bit more normal viewing when you come into a post house. So there's a, a proper mixture, you know, that, that's what we want to embrace through the academy. Uh, mm. That's, that's what tightly attached to be tasked with from our point of view. Okay. And Rowan? Well, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? Because what you want is you want your team to be as established and as talented as possible. So the top bit of the team is fairly stable. And actually, you know, they are... Um, 
rightly or wrongly, are biased towards males and, and biased towards women. So we have lots of initiatives going on to make sure that our training program is as widely opened as possible. We're recruiting at the moment uh, to bring in a whole load of people through the Kitscart scheme. And we have specifically gone out to areas of London where we will have a higher chance of getting diversity um, in, in the applicants. But at the end of the day, we will take the best person for the job. And we, we won't take uh, the person who, who ticks a box if they're not as good as the next person, because we are a service provider and we do have to achieve excellence. And we're looking not only at them joining our company and joining the training program, but also that 10 year path to success. We are slightly luckier in that we've got a few more women than perhaps some of the other post houses. And that's got nothing to do with the fact that I happen to, to be in the organization. We've just got some really lovely, wonderful, uh, creative and, and operational ladies around us. But um, yeah, it's a real challenge. And, and you know, we have to focus first and foremost on the talent of the people and, and then hopefully diversify our recruiting to make it work. Mm, okay. Um, Fiona, do you want to add anything else to that? Um, I'd agree. It is, it is tricky. It is difficult. I mean, recruiting for um, engineers is um, very hard trying to find a female uh, CV that's coming through. Mm. Um, I'm a member of RISE and was a mentor last year, and I think that's a, a very good organisation to get uh, girls uh, grassroots into, um, into broadcasting and uh, more technical roles. Um, and also seeing uh, women not just getting into the industry, but also staying in the industry as well. I think there's a lot of, you know, people sort of, you know, scratching their beards going, why aren't women staying to, you know, move through to the higher ranks? It's like, well, because they've got families, haven't they? Hmm. So it's, it's, you know, trying to uh, work out and navigate that kind of minefield of, of the culture and the way of um, you know broadcast engineering and how it works and shift work and all that kind of stuff and how that's going to work with you know women coming in and women staying and having families and that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, it, it's interesting and there are, I think there is a lot of facets. It's not just bringing women in; it's bringing women in and keeping women in. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And what's Molnair doing, Nigel? Have you brought in any new initiatives around diversity? Yeah, um, so we, we started off with um, one of the first ones to do the Kickstart scheme. Currently, we've got 19 people in the business, and, and, and they range um, um, across the whole roles of, sorry, the whole skills set of, of post production, whether it's administration or training them up. And I think what's interesting already is that you're seeing really great, talented people come through. Uh, to the business. Um, Leslie's currently running a training program as well to work with um, with that sector, Kickstarters, universities and then film schools to, to bring through talent as well. Um, recently we actually tried to put a, a, a female team from the whole of the post-production services onto a production that was coming in um, and it was actually really quite interesting to see that we could field a whole team going through the facility uh, as a full female team. So mm -hmm. I think for me, it, it's about pushing talent and quite honestly, I, I look back at my past and seeing how I was pushed. And I think that there is, as I said earlier, I think it's for us to really help that process because as we as we see with all of our businesses, people move on and we shouldn't be scared about people moving on. It's about bringing people through for the next gen and that's what we need to do. And I think it's one of the key things in the industry that I see is that sometimes you get blockers or you don't get people that want to nurture talent and it's for us to nurture that talent and I, I can say from engineering point of view absolutely we've tried to recruit female engineers but it's very difficult to find certain skilled roles in our sector and that's that's down to I think all of us kind of going giving people an opportunity I think that that's what we have to do as, as, as business um, heads definitely. Mm. I know RISE is also doing some work isn't it within schools to try and uh, bring that opportunity to yeah maybe to de develop a studio and and you know get get the different um children involved in in literally what it, it takes to create a tv studio and hands-on experience so that then they can get enthusiastic about it and maybe 
like uh, a spark in their head that says, oh, yeah, maybe I should investigate what goes on there or, in, you know, engineering roles within the sector. So maybe more initiatives like that would be great too. Um, yeah. Jake, don't forget, we've also got the apprenticeship for post Yes, of course, yeah. yeah. You know, and that, that actually, the first cohort were entirely people from post houses who have been put forward by their employers for further training. This time around, there actually uh, there are people on the cohort who have actually been employed specifically to come into the industry to learn post production through the apprenticeship. So that's a, a, a new initiative this time. Yeah, and that was easy. It was, that was okay to roll out because obviously COVID hit pretty much at the time when you about to roll. teaching is a wonderful tool. Right, <laughs> absolutely. Um, right, I've got more questions, but we've got lots of questions coming in. And I should say that if you want to ask a question, then do type away because they do come through to the uh, area where I'm looking at. And uh, I'll ask a few of them now before going back to my own. They're probably better than mine anyway, <coughs> so let's have a look. Um, right, this is about uh, uh, runners. So what advice would you give to a runner that is trying to get back into post-production in this COVID world? amidst a decrease in hospitality okay um i don't know does anyone want to volunteer to take that one on yeah i, I the, the clients will, will want uh, less service for their rooms but i think that will that will you know, dissipate as, as we progress with it and if you're a runner that's been offloaded and it's go back to what rowan said you know you, we need talented people you know you, and you will offer that job to the best person so any runners out there that you know, are looking, then send CVs in, we'll judge it. We use our academy mainly for our base, for our runners, but our hospitality side will, uh, has dropped massively because the clients you know, demanded that. But it doesn't say we don't want runners to join us because over half the company now is ex-runner and we will yeah. still recruit through the academy to make that work. And you know, going back to what we did with our training rooms, we, we developed and made a female colorist out of that, going back to you know, up in our genre within our department, which is an amazing thing. So yeah, if you're a runner out there that's that wants to get back into it and you haven't been bruised by being offloaded by whoever offloaded you, then let's look at your CV uh, and we're possibly gearing for a, a busy year. And I think the next couple of years are going to be quite performance related and an upturn because there's a lot of work out there at the moment and we just got to get that bit right and balance with the schooling of people and making the next generation. So, okay, send me, Dave, if you're out there listening to me, send me your CV and I'll, I will get back to you. There you go. It's quite, quite uh, something to hear. Um, anyone else offering? Uh... They can send CVs to me, Rowan at ClearCut. Um, but what I would say is that running is not just about hospitality. That It is the beginning of the training for the sector. It is where you learn the language and the 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 invisible body language of uh, and, and the dynamics of a post house and you know over 50 percent of all the mds in the business i'm sure have been runners in their time uh it, it is much more than that and we have a whole training course around all the skills you might need to be able to move forward so don't think it's just about hospitality it's a lot more to it than that. yeah i agree i mean i think from my time in the industry is that i always say to runners when they come in this is your opportunity and whilst you're here you know whether you see a path through you know, whether it's at Pinewood or at Molinaire, um, but your opportunity is to work with the creators around the building and hopefully you'll see your career then go through the areas that you want to. And I think it's, a, you know, absolutely. I think we just need to get back to that point where we get more people through the building and bring people back. So great opportunity, just send your CVs in and uh, keep going. Good stuff. Um, right, I'll go to the next question here as well, which is, um, uh, yeah, I'll go for. Yes, this is interesting. Do you yeah, do you foresee a struggle with your businesses to cope with the influx of work that might be coming your way? And one of my questions was actually about the influx of work from streaming services. There's been more and more streaming services launched uh, from really big brands over the last year, and you know this is good, high-paying work uh, that needs a lot of finishing. Uh, um, a lot of money has been invested into this. Um, there's a limited number of post houses now. And, you know, this is kind of a, a, an interesting chat to be having compared to, say, five years ago, sort of, uh, where everyone was being you know, very competitive about the work out there. But um, are you actually able to cope with this uh, demand that will be uh, not only now, but in the future? I, th I think you have to make yourself cope for it. I mean, when Netflix announced what they wanted to do in London, we, we all went you know, to that gathering in Regent Street, and they were mm. specifically asking for a, a much higher grade of work to be passed through our buildings, and you know, to show that they wanted to come and vet you know, our, our kit, our rooms, our layout, our security. And I welcomed that, and I, I sort of 
make my guys we wanted to get those gold standard awards we got one for pictures and, and for sound but to put us into that frame i think that's the lifeline for the business it's, it's extra work coming into it it's a hell of a cost to add to your, your balance sheet is it going to work and do it but it, it, it will maybe you know, grade certain facilities that do that sort of stuff and don't want to do it but I, I i i think it's a really good thing and it's a, it's a welcome addition of those guys turning up you know two or three years ago to push us with the work and they, they do we do a lot of netflix work and they have a certain standard and they have a certain delivery requirement and uh but yeah it's, it's it's a good thing I, I, if you're not doing it i go out and get the kit and do it tomorrow <laughs> exactly <laughs> we're all investing all the time whether we're investing in space or in kit or in storage or in frontline edit suites or in people we are by natural as service providers our clients dictate their needs and we deliver that is what we all do and uh, you know we're instinctively going to provide what people want so if they want more capacity uh, we're very well placed all of us uh, you know we're all launch pads for, for greater capacity we know how to do it we have the talent we have the the, the infrastructure and backbone to grow so i i think it can be only a good thing especially if the public service broadcasters perhaps are shrinking slightly mm -hmm. um, on, you know, in that balance that happens. Mm. Yeah, I second that. I think if I look at the amount of studios that are coming up in the UK as well and the amount of content that's just going to be around you know, for the next five years, it's going to be very busy. And I sort of think about this and go, currently over the last 15 months, I've built 10 rooms and whether they're Dolby Atmos, 4K, but all of these rooms are all about creating the spaces to deliver this high-end content because it's going to come thick and fast. And you know, whether it's Homer, whether it's Amazon, whether it's um, you know Netflix, you know, there's going to be an amount of content that is such high standard that we need the facilities and the people to be able to deliver that work. And, and as Rowan said, the technology behind it is the key to all of it because we're talking about high-resolution files all the time. Hmm. It's interesting because one of the questions we've had here is is uh, you know, rather than streaming services and a big high-end uh, work, uh, do you guys look to, say, the YouTube generation and the sort of content that's being created for social platforms <clears throat> and think there's a potential opportunity there for post-production? Or, uh, or is that not really something that the post-industry would be interested in pursuing? I think our advertising division embraces that as, as, as a, another way of manipulating the, you know, the agency's product across all the boundaries. So that, that's that's from our side. Long form, not so much, but the advertising guys are doing a lot more of that sort of style of work as well. But also, you know, you, you have to I think you have to stay positive and come out of it. There was work we do. We wanted to look at the you know the, the fixed rig side of things. So we we we, we yeah. You know, made a team and that was an area we never worked on so that's why we opened capture to embrace that sort of work but that's all of a sudden suddenly got very high end with its technique and uh, mm. we've now got three rigs and the fourth one being built funny in our bar right now and that surprised us because we thought that was going to have a certain measure of 300 pieces of glass in you know, a police station somewhere in wherever but it's not it's, it's a high end uh, usage now and they demand unbelievable spec from it and uh, i think we mm. might have called that at the right time so uh, that's a good thing but i agree with ryan you, you, we're in this business and we juggle balls in my office ryan's office everybody's office to make make good of our balance sheet look at our business and look at the periscope at three months time and you have to embrace it and, and be quick off the mark to get there first with, with the tech and, and the creative as well so it's, mm. it's a very trying time the last year was very trying and thank god that our balance sheet remained intact and uh you know it, but yeah there was worry moments of last year which everybody probably would agree on it's on the screen that we looked at a couple of months where it dipped out completely and uh it, it was quite nerve-wracking it was valley at the time but i think we we, we we walked through it and we come out of it and it's uh i'm quite positive about the next couple of years mm. um we have a few more questions <coughs> related to uh <coughs> workforce actually um one is saying, what about employing women who are older and have had a break, but have had lots of experience from the past, bringing those back into post? Maybe that would help with the remote working as well, home working that's been set up over last year. And then there is another, it's not linked, but it's a, about workforce. So I'll ask it at the same time. It says, I find post very unforgiving about disability. To my knowledge, I've never worked with a disabled person and have struggled myself since my cancer diagnosis. Is there anything being done to tackle this? 
So, um, yeah, a couple of questions about opening up your workforce to a sort of broader range of potential people that could work in post-production. And does anyone want to uh, answer that one? I'll take it. Um, uh, happy to return us to work. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, whoever they are, whatever their reasons, if they've got life skills, they're generally, um, they're offering something extra. So that's no problem. People with disabilities, actually, if you worked in our company, you would find that you wouldn't know it, but you would be working alongside some people who've got hidden disabilities uh, of varying sorts. And we love and cherish those people for the talent that they offer. And we make the relevant accommodations. However, it is true to say that it's not always feasible to offer everybody a role in the business at every level. Um, you know, uh, you know it, we have to be pragmatic. We're, we're relatively small businesses and uh, our margins in post are small. We can't just have a group of people because they are, it's good and worthy to have them. They have to be contributing and be a positive force for good in the business. Um, and, and as long as their disability doesn't get in the way of that, then I've got no problems. Okay, good answer. Anyone else? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think every role within our um, within our sectors, you know, it, it really just determines down to talent, you know, and I think there's certain roles that can be done, but, you know, there's there's other roles that can't. But, I mean, I think we all have to be open to, to people coming into our sector. And, and as, as Rowan said, is that, you know, there's always people within our business that, that might be affected by different scenarios. Some we know about, some we don't. And I think, as again, as, as people, as human beings, we have to do the best thing that we possibly can to help that through through the business and, and our current staff as well. Yeah. Dave, anything more? Yeah, I think I think also in the last year that everybody's gone through, there's going to be other issues with what, what, what COVID has done to certain individuals. It's not, you know, it's perhaps not a physicality, it's a mental thing as well. And we, we've embraced quite a few members of the staff with, you know, counselling outside because, you know, some of the young kids, some of the experienced people just found COVID, you know, working from home in isolation, doing some, you know, sinking in group. And it, it is a different mindset than working in a machine room with all your colleagues around you. So we've, we've embraced that. And I think it affected a lot of people more than they more than they would like to admit. But on the question of, you know, would we re-employ some that maybe, you know, gone away and had twins and wants to come back into it, as we've grown, we, if, if they're good enough, they want to come back to it because they would bring, you know, a high level experience. We need that because the training over the next couple of years for our industry is very, very key. And we might have lost a year by this with the unis and the kids coming out that have gone into a, a wasteland if they left last September. And I feel sorry for those guys. So we might have to balance that with a few more experienced people coming back into the workplace and adding the right you know, kids, newbies into it. So, uh, yeah, uh, we would welcome looking at people that do want to come back into the workplace if they've taken a year off or they've had children. We've got you know, ladies here that have come uh, back and we welcome them back and we reduce their working week. But now we can say, OK, you can remote in and work from home. And mm -hmm. have, you know, the certain producers that live here five days a week, but now they're working on attending two or three times a week and and, it, and it's works very, very well. So it, it, it's some good has come out of that in regards to you can do a lot lot more stuff that you used to at work uh, than at home, you know, being, you know, being at home. So uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Very positive response around. Fiona, do you want to say anything about this as well? Yeah, I mean, as a, a, a recent uh, job hunter myself, I absolutely agree with Dave. Um, you know, the remote working stuff has uh, hopefully opened up, you know, more opportunities to people who are coming back, um, you know, from breaks, from, you know, having kids, from having families, that kind of thing. Um, um, the, the, I suppose the, um, you know, advice I would give is if you are coming back into the industry, uh, your personal network is key. I'm finding at the moment there is a lot of work out there that's being advertised, a lot of jobs, which is great. Um, but the amount of people going for those jobs at the moment is probably four or five fold on what mm. it usually is. So yeah, it's 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 buoying and it's it's positive that there there are jobs out there and things are starting to open up, but there are still a lot of people going for those jobs. So the networking and personal network is, is really going to come in key there. Hmm. I think since they've had a lot of questions around this whole recruitment side of things and people wanting to get in the industry or people that have had experience that are left and want to come back, um, 
I, I think uh, I speak on behalf of the panel. Everyone would be quite keen to hear from anyone that's listening that does want to find out more about different training opportunities or different opportunities that are available through the post houses that are being represented here today. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure we can share email addresses afterwards and, and you can sure. get in contact directly yeah, with, with the panelists. So um, we, we have to wrap up now. I'm, I'm sorry, I've got more questions here that I, I wanted to ask, but uh, it's been a great, great session. And thanks for being so involved with all your questions. And thanks for the panelists for some brilliant, um, honest answers. And, and I have to say, you know, a really positive outlook as well for the, for the years ahead. So that, that's great to hear too. Thanks very much, everyone. Jake, well done. Nice one. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Take care and see you guys. See All you right. soon. Bye. Lovely to see you.